But when you search the word of God, you realize that there are ten kinds of healing in the Bible. When you search the word of God, you realize that there are ten kinds of healing in the Bible. For example, in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verse 26, the Bible talks about bodily healing, the healing of the human body. Then in the book of Psalms 41, verse 4, the Bible talks about the healing of the human soul. Then in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, the third type of healing is the healing of the land. Then the fourth type of healing is from Psalms 147, verse 3. When you read that, you will see that there's a healing of the broken hearts. Then there's a fifth type of healing, which can be found in Jeremiah 3, verse 22. The healing of backslidings. There are ten kinds of healings in the Bible. The sixth one can be found in Exodus chapter 15, verse 25. The healing of water. The healing of water. The seventh kind of healing is from Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14, which is the healing of hearts. Human hurts, healing of human emotions. Praise God. Then the eighth kind of healing can be found in Jeremiah chapter 51 from verse 8 to 9, which is the healing of kingdoms. The healing of kingdoms. The ninth type of healing is... In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 26, which is national healing. Somebody bless the Lord. Then the tenth kind of healing is from Revelation 22, verse 2, which is the healing of the nations. The goal for the healing of the nations is for the preservation of lives. Amen. I sense the power of God. I sense the Holy Spirit. The power of God is all over this place. The Holy Spirit is put in my heart to share with you tonight the healing of the wounded vision. The healing of the wounded vision. And children of God, because I believe that God is doing a meticulous work in this service, our text is going to be from the book of Ezra, chapter 3. So I ask you to bear with us as we read most of that chapter, because that chapter is relevant to where God wants us to go. Praise God. Father, we give you praise. Amen. So Ezra chapter 3, we'll begin from verse 1. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Juzadak, and his brethren the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of shall tell and his brethren and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon as it is written in the law of Moses the man of God and they set the altar upon his basis for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, 
and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. And afterward, offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of everyone that willingly offered the free will offering unto the Lord. I'm on verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters, and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon, and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now... In the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests, and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Joshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Henadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good, hallelujah, for his mercy endure forever toward Israel. If God has been good to you, say amen. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. Now, I would like you to pay attention now to verse 13, because this is the climax. The Bible says, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy, from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Somebody bless the Lord. The Lord wants us to deal with the subject by his special grace of the healing of the wounded vision. And the Lord is saying that there's somebody here that you're so hurt and you're so wounded by whatever you went through, by whatever happened, there's been so much pain and hurt. And God is telling me to tell you today that your shout must, must, must. Oh, you know, hear what I'm saying? That your shout must sound louder than your cries. While the old man who knew what the temple looked like, who knew about the costly stones? Who knew about how much more extravagant the original temple were compared to the current temple? While they were trying to cry, the new folks who did not know anything were praising God. And the Lord said to somebody, I know you're hurt, but your praise must out loud. You must praise him somebody bless the Lord the Lord said you got to praise me more than you cry your praise must be louder than your cries 
The Lord said, you, you cannot allow the enemy to box you in a corner and have you stay there morning and day and night, moaning and groaning. The Lord said, there's something good in your life that you can pick up and talk to God about. There are some things that are still good in your life. Things may not have gone the way you want them to go. But the Lord says, excuse me, don't let the devil only show you the bad. Don't let the devil only show you the things that could have been that had not been. But the Lord says, excuse me, could you turn your eyes to the things that are? Could you look at the things that I've been doing? Your life is not as bad as you think. The Lord says, somebody, you can still praise. Don't let the devil steal your praise. You can still shout. Don't let the devil steal your shout. Don't allow the situation to, to, to take the joy out of your life. The Lord says, you can keep living. Keep living. Don't give up that easy. Don't give up that easy. Thank God for the people that were shouting. And the Lord is saying to somebody tonight, you can take praise and neutralize your pain. Oh, you don't hear me. Your, uh, the Lord said praise can heal your pain. When, you, when, you don't, when it doesn't make sense, praise. When there's nobody to answer your questions, Praise. When you feel like not going forward, praise. The Lord say, your praise will bring healing. Somebody bless the Lord. I don't know who you are, but the Lord said, do you understand what they were telling you? That God in Psalms 22 verse 3 says that first he's holy, then he inhabits the praises of his people. God is not saying that the people that praise him didn't have pain. The young people that were praising God here heard the cries of the old generation, but they refused to let the devil have his way. They continued to praise because there, somebody, the Lord said, do you understand what we're saying? Things may not be going all that good in your eyes, but praise me. The Lord is looking for some people tonight that will give him a sacrifice of praise. People that will praise him when it doesn't make any sense. People that will exalt his name. People that will magnify his name. People that will say, oh God, I don't understand, but I need you to come into this situation. Somebody bless the Lord. The Lord said, don't you know that praise is the devil repellent? The more you praise, the further away from you the devil will be. Yes, you're hurting, but talking about it, moaning about it, crying about it, wallowing in it, swimming in it, it's not going to help you. But the Lord said, I've got something that can help you. You can jump and say, praise God. The Lord said, do something you've never done. Praise me. Let the shout of praise neutralize the voice of pain. Somebody bless the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody ought to lift up their hands and say, Heavenly Father, heal my wounded vision. Oh, somebody bless the Lord. Child of God, let, let me give you three things that will help you to know whether your vision has been wounded or not. There are three things. One is lack of motivation to pursue your goals. If you used to be passionate about your goal, the vision that you believe that God has given you, and now, for some reason, you just sense yourself dragging, it's because something has hurt you. Maybe you used to, in your marriage, it just, you can't wait to get home. All of a sudden now, you feel happier being outside of the house. More than you are being inside the house. 
but also your vision has been wounded. Maybe you used to like to go to work. You'd be the first person to get there. But some things happen at work. And now, you that used to get there and make coffee for everybody, set up all the donuts, are coming late. And some days you want to call and you don't even want to be there. But listen, it's because your vision has been wounded. When there's a lack of motivation to pursue your goal, when you feel like, oh, why am I even trying? You've been wounded. And the Lord said, not only is it that you're wounded, but you need to address the pain. You have to heal. Can you tell someone to say, you've got to heal. In the name of Jesus, you must heal so you can go forward. Here's another thing, second thing that will let you know if you have a wounded vision. Is in your heart, if there's a presence of many unanswered questions in your life, you know that you love God from your own way and according to the word. But there are some things that happen and you feel like saying, Lord, can we talk? If you feel like, God, I don't understand. When you have many unanswered questions in your life, it's because your vision has been wounded. You've got to heal from this because this leads to doubt. And it leads, because what the devil wants to do is to get you to distrust the power of God. Because when you were a, a, a brand new Christian, you believed God for everything. But all of a sudden, stuff that you believe in God for didn't happen. And you don't know how to explain it. And you feel like saying, excuse me, can we talk? And there's nobody to talk to. The only person you can talk to is God. And, and, and you want to talk to him from your own sense. But you can't talk to him from your own sense because God is not a man. Oh, somebody bless the Lord. Inside of you, you know that you can blame him because he's perfect. But you're like, there's a struggle there. There's a hurt. And the Lord say, Abba, Shane, Hisala, Hasaba. Thus, I'm here to heal you and to answer your questions. Or somebody say, yes, Lord. Here's a third thing that will let you know that you have, um, you have wounded vision. Is when there's a battle with your past failures. When you tried to do something in the past and you failed. And now you're sensing that God wants you to do it again. Maybe you took an exam and you didn't do well. But now you want to do it. And now inside of you, there's this fear. Oh, goodness. I don't want to go through this. What's the point in trying? I tried and it didn't work. I did this, it didn't work. I've taken the medication. You know, the Lord says, excuse me, pause. Pause. You say, but I really prayed. I tried my best. But the Lord said, listen to me. You need to be healed. You need to be healed before you try again. Because you, you, don't have your mind, you don't have a sound mind right now. No, it's not complete. Your, your mind needs to be healed right now. Because you've been wounded. And children of God, watch this. There are three things that will let you know if you have a wounded vision. But there are three things that the devil consistently uses in wounding or even destroying your vision. You need to understand it. The Lord is going to heal you in this service. I believe that. But you need to know how the devil brings wounds and pains and try to steal and kill and destroy the vision that God has for you. Here's the first thing you need to understand. Go to the book of Exodus. 
There are three things that the devil consistently uses in wounding or even destroying a vision. Exodus 23. Somebody bless the Lord. Amen. Exodus 23, from verse 20 to 23. Father, I give you praise. Amen. He reads, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place where I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. But if thou shalt, Indeed, obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy enemies. Somebody say, Glory to God. And an adversary unto thine adversaries. Somebody say, Amen. For my angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites. And the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Amen. The first thing that the devil used in destroying the vision is the lifestyle of sin. It's the lifestyle of sin. You see, remember, any vision that is from God is something that you cannot do by yourself. It's, it's bigger than your logic. You can't do it alone. And the only way it can be achieved is through the help of God. Now, one of the things that the Lord does according to the word of God is when God impregnates you with a the vision, then God will assign an angel to walk with you, to bring you into victory, to bring you into the fulfillment of that vision. And your ability to succeed. Your success has a lot to do with the, your relationship with the angel that God has sent to lead you into the manifestation of the vision. That's why you have to be careful about things that offend your angel. Do you understand? And the Lord said, when you live a lifestyle of sin, you hinder your angel. Your angel can't defend you. They can't protect you. They're immobilized. They can't move. And the devil will be moving on, destroying and doing things. It's not that you won't succeed, but God is waiting for you to stop sinning. Do you understand? So, because sometimes you can check in your life and say, oh, look, I don't know what's happening in my life. I don't know why this is not happening. I don't know why this is not happening. But I'm here tonight to ask you a simple question. Search your heart and really see, do you have a habitual sin in your life? A sin that you like, that you enjoy. And, and the, to you, it may be little. You say, well, I flirt a little bit. I do, But it's little to you. But it's not little in the eyes of the angel that has been set to lead you to victory. And the Lord said, it's serious. If you want manifestation from God, you have to live a holy life. And if you don't live a holy life, you're going to be frustrated. Because even the angels that are assigned to go with you are frustrated. So the Lord said, listen, if you just make up your mind and say, God, help me, to help me to stop sinning. Identify what that habitual sin is. Everybody, hey, you got an issue. You know what that issue is. You may think it's nothing, but it's big in the eyes of God. You say, well, I can play around with, with people, but I don't really mean to, to have any intimacy with them. <laughs> There's no playing around here. God wants to make you a ruler. Do you understand what we're saying? 
And if it's, if it's not 12 inches, it cannot be a ruler. It can be 11 and a half. It can be 10. It's got to be 12 inches to make it a ruler. But you get in the point. So, so, so the devil makes you enjoy that sin. And in exchange for his sin, he takes your power. And he hinders your breakthrough. Do you understand? So that's why the Lord is saying the first thing is that you have to stop having a lifestyle of habitual sin. Maybe your habitual sin is anger. He said, well, people make me angry. The Lord said, no, 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 no. You don't understand what we're saying here. Nobody can make you angry. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that anger rests in the stomach of a fool. And you're not a fool. The Lord said, I told you, even if you're angry, don't go to bed with it. Okay? Nobody can make you. You see, someone said this out loud. said, my relationship with God needs to be very important to me to the point that I'm willing to forgive anyone and everyone who hurt me just to maintain my relationship with God. Amen. Praise God. So th remember that message, the things that the devil wants you to do daily? The devil is counting on somebody but not anybody here anymore. Not anybody that has listened to this message. It's counting on some people to do immorality every day. It's counting on them to lie every day. It's counting on them to watch bad movies every day. It's counting on them to watch bad uh, magazines every day. It's counting on you to just flirt every day. As long as you keep doing the same sin, you're going to be in the same spot. You can cry all you want. If it doesn't work, until you change. But you know what? He will help us change. All he wants us to do tonight is say, Lord, I desire to change. Amen. There are three things that the devil consistently use in wounding a vision. You see, God can give someone a prophetic word. He can say to somebody, you're going to be a senator, for example. And prophesy that you will win the election. I mean, right there. And it's an accurate prophecy. But if you leave from that prayer meeting, and you go to a nightclub, and start drinking and dancing with the heathen, and start living a contrary life, God can't fulfill that prophecy. The angel that is sent, oh my God, did you hear what the Lord is telling me? The Lord said, every time a prophetic word is given to you, an angel is assigned to manifest it. That's why I read the book of Judges, and you see, when God gave the children of Israel that land, right? He sent an angel to bring them into victory. And when they couldn't get the land, the angel came and said, wait a minute, I've got something against you. You didn't get the victory not because you don't have the power, but you didn't get the victory because of the sin in your life. Okay, so you can't say that somebody gave you a wrong prophecy. No. There's the issue is that God is a God of conditions. There's no blank checks. Do you understand? So God give you a word that you're healed. That you won't die. But if you go out there and start drinking rum every day, you will kill yourself. The, for example, in the book of Joshua chapter 1, the Lord said to Joshua, nobody, in my paraphrase, can stand before you. Nobody can defeat you. But again, in the book of Joshua chapter 6, AI defeats Israel. And Joshua lays on the floor saying, God, this is not your word. You promised me that nobody can whip me, that nobody can defeat me. And the Lord said, that's true, but you sinned. And when you sinned, you restricted me. Read Joshua chapter 6 and 7. It will be clear to you. You see what the Lord is saying? 
So the Lord is saying, the devil is counting on you sinning so he can stop the manifestation of your blessing. And guess what? Now, what's where the wound comes in, okay? Now, what's this? God gave you the word, but you sinned. You forgot that you sinned. What you told you didn't happen. Now you're hurt and you're upset with God. And the Lord says, excuse me, I'm not the one that stopped it. You stopped it. But you know what? You can still get that blessing. Oh, somebody say, God, don't allow me to lose my blessing. Amen. Do you see that? So if, if there are hurts that are the result of your sin, who should you blame? You see, you see, the devil tricked you. So what you want to do is say, God, send your word into my heart and heal me from this wound and help me to live righteously. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's the second thing that the devil does consistently in in wounding or even trying to destroy people's vision. But let's look at Exodus chapter 5 from verse 20 to 23. I want you to be careful with this one. This one is a little, is is, is powerful. The, The word is powerful. But somebody may be going through this right now. Exodus chapter 5, from verse 20 to 23, somebody bless the Lord. Amen. It says, And they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way, as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our savour, to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou s- <laughs> Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated these people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh, To speak in thy name, he had done evil to this people, neither has thou delivered thy people at all. Disappointment. Disappointment. The devil will use disappointment to really paralyze somebody's vision. Here in Exodus chapter 5, here's a good case. The Lord sent Moses. He told him to go to Pharaoh. Moses heard right. The people were suffering, but it wasn't that much. So Moses went there, that saying what God told him to say with expectation. Then when he got there, the Pharaoh would let the people go. So when Moses finished talking, he got Pharaoh double the task. Now the people are screaming. Moses, you said that you would deliver us. Now, because of you, our problem has more than doubled. And the people are like, we're going to tell God to take you out of here. Because you're hurting us. Have you ever been disappointed? You say, but I know that God told me to go do this. Why is it not working? Why is it not working? I know that the Lord told me to witness to this person at my work. I know that the human resources rule says don't witness here. And I was ready to obey that rule. I wasn't trying to Cause any problem in this company, I like this job. They pay me well. Now the Lord tells me to go witness. I witness and they report me to human resources director. And I'm writing up. God, what's going on? 
Did I hear from God right? You see, the devil is beginning. That is where the devil fights your ability to hear from God. Oh, somebody, I don't know if you've been there. Because the devil knows if he leaves you alone and you hear from God clearly, he's gone. So he must fight your ability to hear from God so that you will hear from God right and do it and a problem will come out. You say, this thing cannot be from God because it's from God. There will be no problem. And the Lord said to tell you, I am stronger than your confusion. It is from God. But the Lord is training you. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. God was the one that sent Moses to Pharaoh. I'm sure. So sometimes, watch this, be careful with this. God can allow you to enter into trouble on purpose. And when some people enter into trouble, it can wound their vision. All of a sudden, the devil tells them, you know, he can't trust God. Because this, look at what you're going through. And when someone else comes up and says, well, God told me to do this. You're like, well, all right. Because the last time you tried to do something that you felt like God told you, it got you in problems. But the Lord said, you're not really in problems, you're in training. The problem is the way you're interpreting what is happening to you. And the problem is that you're asking the devil to explain the puzzles of your life to you instead of coming back to God. Moses at least came back to God and said, God, what is going on? And the Lord reassured him, surely Pharaoh will let the people go. I don't know who you are that's listening here. The Lord says, surely you will be delivered. He said, but God, every time I try to, the Lord says, I know, I know, I know. Just stick with me and don't give up. Don't stop coming to church. Don't stop praying. Don't stop reading the word. I know you're hurting, but let praise, exchange praise for the cry. Exchange praise for the pain. It's not over until God says it's over. Somebody has won. Amen. There are three things that the devil will always use. Here's the third one. To wound the visions of people. Exodus chapter 13 from verse 17 to 18. Somebody bless the Lord. Exodus 13, 13, from verse 17 to 18. Father, we give you praise. It says, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, they will repent there to change their minds, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Somebody bless the Lord. Somebody must get out of bondage. Amen. The third thing the devil uses is delay, delay, delay. Why is this taking so long? God, you already delivered us from Egypt. Why is it taking long? We want to get to the land of Canaan quick. <laughs> the Lord said, that's what you think. You see, everyone here needs to understand that God has a blueprint for your life. God doesn't make mistakes. God is a master architect. He's working in you, through you, for him, according to his purpose for your life. 
And sometimes, you know, people will say, oh, it's taking so long for this to come to pass. But the Lord said, based on, are they God? Do you know what God is doing? You say, well, someone else started their business. And in less than six months, they are millionaires. But you've been in business 10 years. Where's your money? You need to close down this business and start another one. <laughs> Somebody bless the Lord. You made a mistake. Job's wife said to Job, curse God and die. And Job said, no way. You see, you see someone said this, Allah said, my relationship with God is not connected to his hands. My relationship with him, I'm seeking his face. Do you understand? You need to ask yourself, why do you really want a big church? Do you really want one? Why? Do you want it so you can be respected? You see, that's pride. Do you know if you have one million members, that one million people you got to pray for every day? If you're really biblical, why do you want to be a millionaire? Why? So you can go to nightclubs? They'll get a divorce and get another wife, get a get divorce and get another husband. The Lord said, I know you. You're not crucified yet. And some people, the moment, the moment they get money in their hands, they're gonna sue everybody. The Lord said, I need, I know what I'm doing in your life. But you see, when you bring nothing wrong with corporate America, God bless our nation. Amen. But when you bring the mentality of corporate America into your relationship with God, then you're going to suffer. Because in corporate America, everything is in a hurry. And five years from now, I want to be the vice president. I want to be this. In God, five years from now, you don't know. Because he's the one that's leading you. The only thing you know is that God is with me. And I live a holy life. And I'm in the word by his grace. That he will lead you. He may lead you to nations of the earth. He don't know what he's going to do. You are his workmanship. You're not your own. So you can't say, oh, he's taking too long for this, or he's taking too long for that, because you don't know what he's doing. But if you have a last of sin, things can take forever. Do you understand? But if you live right, it takes time. I'm not prophesying this over anybody here, over the ministry, over anyone that's listening on the radio. But listen to this. Jesus was born. And he took time to grow. And then he kept growing for 30 years in order to preach for three and a half years. <laughs> So, we see, one of the problems in Christianity is we have a lot of fast food Christians. We have a lot of ministries in high places that were fast food ministries. They just get up overnight and boom, they're everywhere. But they're not established in the word. They're not rooted in the word. You can make people shout, but you can't get anybody's life changed. Because the power to change is not in you because he, God hasn't processed you enough to trust you with that power. Did you hear what was said? God has to process you enough to trust you with the power. You remember Solomon? Great worshiper. Prayed, God answered him. But did he make it? He didn't follow him fully because he wasn't fully processed. It's not about starting, but it's about finishing well. And you can't finish well if you're not fully processed. Do you understand? So we, you need to humble yourself. You say, well, God told me this. I tried to do it. It didn't work. Now I'm upset. They gave me a prophetic word. Where is the prophetic word? They say, hold up. Stop. Check yourself. Examine yourself. After you've examined yourself, to see, are you in the faith? Are you living right? 
Are you living according to the word of God? If you're not, correct it. If you don't correct it and you're blaming God, you're wasting your time. Correct it. Then here's another thing you need to do. God is not in a hurry. So stop being in a hurry. The biggest thing you need to do is to spend time with God. Somebody sent me a text. This is a text or an email. And they said, what do I need to do in order to hear from God? I laughed. After I finished laughing, I text back, read the Bible. <laughs> no other book can help you hear from God. And God is such an awesome God that he resists 911 relationships. You can say, oh God, I'm going to get this book, I'm going to close my eyes, I'm going to dance around, I'm going to say some scriptures, I'm going to hear from you. It don't work that way. It, you have to show him that you want him and court him. Spend time with God. Then as you spend time with him, showing him you're in for the long haul, then the word that is alive will begin to speak to you, will begin to quicken you. Are you wounded? Do you have a wounded vision? The Lord said to tell you today that's healing for you. For every disappointment in your life, there is healing. If you've been disappointed, would you just lift up your right hand as I'm speaking right now? And the Lord, I hear the Lord say, I'm turning every disappointment into a divine appointment. Say amen. In the name of Jesus. Just remember this. God is able to turn the things around. Have you been going through delay? I hear the Lord say to tell you, delay is not denial. It's not. It may have taken too long, but it's not over. And sometimes some people will say, well, but I'm getting old. And I want to be able to enjoy this breakthrough. The Lord said to tell you, the same God that made Moses live 120 years old can make you live 120 years old. You just got to change the way you think. Change the way you think. Stop thinking old. Think young. Stop talking old. Talk youth. Stop being negative. Speak the word. You see, the world says be positive, but there's some situations you can go through in life where you can't be positive. The only thing you can be to get through is the word. Because anything you speak in crisis, other than the word, the devil can easily challenge and cast down. And I don't know who you are. I'm here to promise you in the name of Jesus Christ that the bad things that happen to other people will not happen to you. So don't you even go there. In the name of Jesus, we will finish well. Say, I receive. Amen. The Lord loves you. He wants you healed. You say, well, people hurt me. The Lord said, I know. I was there. But God, here's my question. Why did you allow it to happen? You know, God, it hurts. Why did you allow it to happen? And I've sensed that the Lord is just, when you said that, he's opening his palm before you said, do you see the scars? It hurts. But I allowed it to happen so I can cover your pain. And what you're going through is hurting you deeply right now because you have taken your eyes off the cross. The Lord said, take it off the pain and put it back on me. He said, oh, God, it's so hard. He said, I know. You see, when things that hurt happen to you, 
if you think about it, it hurts more. Listen now, but if you think about me, I can ease the pain. And I'll bring healing to you. Would you receive the healing from the cross? Would you receive the healing from the precious blood of Jesus? He said, oh, Lord, can I revenge the Lord? Said, no, no, don't go there. Because if you put it in your own hands, then it's out of my hands. And now you're in the devil's hands. Let me do it my way. My way will never fail. He said, Lord, but you take too long. Like Jonah said, God, I know you're too merciful. I want you to wipe out Nineveh. I can't stand them. Look at what they did to Israel. Child of God, God loves us. Be healed tonight. Be healed, you that are listening by the radio. Be healed, you that have gotten this CD in the name of Jesus. And let's round up with this word from the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, from verse 13. Somebody bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Philippians 3, from verse 13. He reads, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody bless the Lord. Look at what he's saying. He says in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, He's saying, literally, all this stuff don't make sense to me yet. I don't understand it all. But one thing I've made the decision is, whatever bad things happened yesterday, I let it go. I'm not going to hold on to it anymore. I've got to let it go because I know that God has a destiny that I need to pursue. It hurts, but I've got to let it go. They did me wrong but I've got to let it go. I thought God God told me to do it, and it didn't work out that way. Child of God, you've got to let it go. But I studied, and I didn't pass that exam. Child of God, you need to let it go and move on. God says, remember not the former things. Behold, I do a new thing. Don't spend time with the past when it's negative. Learn from it, shake it off, and move on. Somebody receive that word and use praise to overshadow your pain. Let the shout of praise be higher than the shout of cries. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you.